pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Euro Fordis from University of Virginia. So his talk today is uh, statistical solutions for equations of uh, fluid dynamics. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction and for invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to give a talk on your seminar. And I'm going to talk about the joint work with Vladimir Shverak from University of Minnesota. And uh, I'll try to explain in the first half of the talk, it might be a very long introduction to somehow explain what's the problem about and why are, why are we studying certain, certain functionals. All right, so let me start with the Euler's equation. Hopefully everybody saw this equation already. So the Euler's equation is the equation for the evolution of a velocity of a fluid. And that's denoted by U and pi is the pressure of the fluid. And we are going to consider that uh, the divergence of our vector field is always zero. So uh, for simplicity, our domain is going to be a two dimensional torus. And I'm going to comment on the other domains and also what, what, my, what we might expect if there is sufficient theory in three dimensions. So the vorticity formulation as usual is going to be this one. So if omega is just a curl of u, then omega is a real value. It's not a vector valued function. It's a real valued function that satisfies the simple equation one. It's only two terms. Uh, partial derivative with respect to t of omega plus u times grad omega is equal to zero, where u is recovered from omega by this Biosavard law, which is a linear functional, a linear operator. Unfortunately, it's, it's non-local. It's like, uh, uh, we, we, we will see that what that one is later on. So the boundary conditions on the torus, we are going to assume that everything has zero mean. It means that all the functions in this talk will have zero mean. Uh, that really means that integral of omega t is equal to zero. So uh, for simplicity, uh, we are going to assume that the initial condition is going to be a bounded function, an infinity function. And you can, you can work with something more smooth. And I'll tell you just on the next slide why, why weaker assumptions we don't really care about. So our goal uh, is to investigate the properties of the vorticity as time goes to infinity. So, uh, right. So first of all, let's look at the let's look at the basic theorem. If we can even say what is the solution, and that's a classical theorem proved by Yudovich in 1963, which is telling us that there exists a unique global weak solution, uh, meaning solution in L infinity in space and time, and this uh, solution is bounded by the initial conditions. And the solution depends continuously on the initial conditions and uh, somehow in a weak topology, meaning that if the initial condition is weakly, weak star converging to omega naught, then for every single fixed time, we have also weak star convergence of solutions. So that really means that uh, we can view Euler's equation as a dynamical system on the closed unit ball in L infinity because it stays in, the, in, this, in this ball determined by the initial conditions uh, with the weak star topology, because we have continuous dependence on initial conditions in that topology. The advantage of that one is that a unit ball or ball of radius R in the weak star topology is, is going to be a compact set. So that really means that we have a dynamical system on a, on a compact set on the, in, in the infinite dimensional space. So we can actually uh, solve uh, the Euler's equation by, if we know the Lagrangian flow, so there is somehow an equivalent notion. So if we know the velocity, we can form this uh, Lagrangian flow phi uh, for every single initial condition x. And then uh, uh, since uh, Euler's equation is just a transport equation, then the solution at the time t at at the position phi t, which is pretty much the, the position carried by the flow, is the same as the value of the, of the initial condition. All right, so we have a good dynamical system on, uh, on compact, compact space. And so that we can, we can talk about the limit profiles, meaning that 
what's happening if the time goes to infinity. So we are going to, uh, as usual, denote the omega limit set, which is going to be the V closure of the trajectory. So I'll take the trajectories for all large times, take the weak star closure, that's the topology we are working in, and then take the intersection for all times, for all positive times. And this is pre presumably going to give us uh, the limit profiles of for the others equation. All right, so what can we say about uh, about these uh, these omega limit sets, or in general about the, the, the solutions? So first of all, we know that uh, we have this Lagrangian flow, and U is divergence free. So since U is divergence free, then we can view um, the solution simply as a map. Of the of the, our initial condition with respect to phi, which is phi is an area preserving diffeomorphism. That's false from the fact the phi is area preserving diffeomorphism, false from the fact that the divergence of u is equal to zero. We just simply solve the equation and, and, and see that this, this, this is what it is. Now, now what is going to be the omega limit set? Well, it's going to be something, it's going to be pretty difficult, but nevertheless. It's definitely going to lie in the weak closure of the set that I denoted O star of omega naught, which is just simply a mapping of the omega zero by these area preserving diffeomorphisms. So the omega limit set is going to be the closure in, in the closure of that. All right. So what can we say from the from the basic viewpoint about the sets O of omega of O star of omega naught? And that's actually pretty bad news because they are infinite dimensional sets. We, are, we don't, it's, it's, it's probably true that there are manifolds, but that's, that's not an easy proof. But nevertheless, they have infinite dimensions and they have infinite co-dimension. And as we know from, even for the linear spaces, uh, from, from the functional analysis, it's pretty hard to work with the, with the spaces that have infinite dimension and infinite co-dimension. All right, nevertheless, let's try to proceed and investigate it a little bit farther. So Euler's equation is kind of a Hamiltonian system. Uh, actually, it's a Poisson system uh, since it admits a Poisson brackets. And there is no additional smoothing or, or time stabilization uh, or anything like that. So we don't have any diffusion. We don't have any dispersion. This is pretty much transport equation. So we don't, we don't assume any, any smoothing. Uh, what's going to be uh, quite useful for us is this definition of the stream function. Stream function is simply just the inverse of the vorticity. And it turns out that if I take the equation Laplace of phi is equal to f of phi, where f is any reasonably regular function, say continuous, then uh, any solution of this equation is going to be an equilibrium of the Euler's equation. That's an easy algebraic exercise. So that really means that we have infinite dimensional manifold of equilibria. So uh, there are many, many, many equilibria and uh, every, the whole dynamics is living on this set of O omega naught, which has not too good functional analytic properties. This is just a remark that if f is positive, if the derivative of f is positive, then uh, this equilibrium is going to be stable. And stability is again not completely clear in which sense it's understood. I don't want to dwell too much on the details because this is not the main topic. But this is somehow a stability in the weak sense only at time infinity. So pretty much everything will go in the higher and higher frequencies, and at the time infinity. Uh, you will you will have a weak convergence to the equilibrium. So this is not a classical classical thing that you might expect from from stability. All right, so let's look at the, a little bit farther on the structure of the equation, which is going to characterize also this set O of omega naught, which is kind of equivalent definition. So what we can view this Euler's equation again is a dynamical system. And the Euler's equation has uncountably many conserved quantities. So it has inf infinitely many invariants, and they're called Casimirs. And that pretty much says that if I take any reasonable function, any continuous function, then integral over the torus of this f of t of uh, omega tx dx is uh, constant in time. 
So this is an invariant. So if you think about this one, then we are foliating the whole space into these leaves that are given by these infinite Casimir invariants. And since there are infinitely many of them, these leaves are going to have infinite co-dimension and they are still infinite dimensional, the leaves. And uh, on the top of that, we have one special invariant that's going to be important for us. It's called energy and it's simply just integral of u squared. And the energy constraint is not really a leaf. So the, Cas the Casimirs are going to give us convex sets and the intersection of convex sets is going to be convex. So that's, that's giving us a convex leaf. But the energy constraint is kind of a unit sphere. So it's not convex. And that's, that's some blob that's going to give us non-convexity of the whole problem. And then on top of that, across all these leaves and also the energy constraint is this infinite dimensional manifold of equilibria. So we are kind of working on these infinite dimensional leaves, plus we have these big manifolds of equilibria. Now it's going to be important for us that there are actually not, not other known invariants for the, on the torus. And that was that's the result uh, by Serre from 1984. Uh, there are other invariants say on the whole space since there is a translation invariant. So there is a conservation of momentum. And for example, on the on the disk, there is a conservation of the angular momentum. So there, there are other invariants, but not on the torus, not known invariants. All right, so what do we expect from the long-term behavior? So uh, if you look at the numerics and also by experiments, either in labs or by nature, uh, we are we are observing for the if we if we let the Euler's equation to evolve for a sufficiently long time, then we see very, very uh, coherent structures. And those are either these lines in the, like the bars in the atmosphere of the Jupiter, or when uh, we saw that one is this big red spot on the face of the, of the Jupiter. So if you look at, for example, numerical simulation of Boucher and Simonet, then you see that for large times, the solutions will look either like these I, like this, uh, they call it dipoles, because here is a positive one and there is the negative one in the corners, or the, these bar states where the solution depends only roughly on the one variable. It depends only on the x1 variable and the, and the x2 direction is constant. So, all right. So what's kind of do we expect from the, from the Euler's equation is the energy is transferred to smaller and smaller scales by this uh, Kreichnam cascade. But the conservation of the energy also implies that there is an inverse cascade and to, to conserve the energy. So uh, we expect that you know, the energy goes down to the smaller and smaller scales, but something to compensate the energy must go back to the, to the larger scales. And that should form these coherent structures that we are seeing in, in numerics or in the nature. All right, so this is, this is somehow related to the, to the whole models of turbulence in the 2D developed by Kreisner. All right, so let's look at the long-term behavior. So what can we say about our omega limit set? So we agree that omega limit set is going to be somehow the weak star limit of the, of the, of the trajectories. So we are, this is exactly what it says, it's going to be set of functions such that we have the weak star convergence of omega tn along some sequence of times to this, this, to this function. Now, what, how this interacts with our, our invariants? So first of all, the Casimir invariants are not weak star continuous. It's a, it's a composition of the function with the sequence and it's not happy with the weak, weak, weak star convergence. However, for the convex functionals, for the convex F, uh, we have that they are uh, weakly lower semi-continuous. And uh, it really means that since, since, the, since they're uh, preserved by the, by the flow, it means that F of omega Tn is going to be the same as F of omega zero. But at the end, we might, uh, might not have equality, but by the weak lower semi-continuum, 
functions in the omega limit set should satisfy this inequality. On the other hand, so, so and that's for the convex. And we, will, we, we prove that all other Casimir invariants are actually lost. It means that they are not bearing, carrying any information about the, about the omega limit set, and they are putting no constraint over there. On the other hand, if we are looking at the energy, energy is it's better with this respect because remember, uh, velocity is uh, we recovered from vorticity by this Biot-Savard law, which pretty much say take the inverse Laplace of omega that's going to give you the stream function, and then take the gradient, say the perpendicular gradient of u. But that really means that we are gaining one derivative on u compared to omega. So if omega n is converging weakly, then u is going to converge strongly, but simply by compact embeddings. So that really means that the energy is going to be preserved also for the functions in the, in the limit set. All right, so that really means that uh, we, the constraints that we have on, on omega limit set are these Casimirs that are inequalities plus the energy, which is an equality. All right, so. By the, by the general theory in the weak convergence of omega limit sets, uh, we can view this uh, sequence of omega t when t goes to infinity, uh, it's going to converge to the Young's measure. And we can view this one as, a, as this one. For, so imagine for every point x in the, on the torus, uh, we are, for, for each point x, we are going to assign like a one dimensional interval which is between the L infinity of the infinity of the initial condition because that's raised by the Udovich theorem. And on this small interval, or not small interval, on this interval at every point X, I'm going to put the distribution. And this distribution is at, at this and sensitive to the small scales. So in the terms of these Young measures, uh, this whole, in this whole ansatz, the Casimir invariants are going to be translated into this constraint. So the integral of f of y uh, times rho kappa dy dx should be less or equal than my initial condition. So again, this is coming from the, from the constraint plus the lower semi-continuity. And this is true for any convex f. All right, so what did people do in this direction? So first of all, uh, many people tried for the Euler's equation finite dimensional approximations. Okay, so if you try the finite dimensional approximation, then it's a Hamiltonian system. So there is a canonical invariant measure, which is given, it's the Lebesgue measure, which is given by the Liouville theorem. And then you can, you can calculate or construct some Gibbs measures based on your approximations. So you discretize, you have a finite dimensional dynamical system, you have, the, you have the Gibbs measure, and then you try to pass to the limit. So uh, it was already done in the physical space by Onzager back in 1949. And he approximate, as I said, uh, discretize the, the torus approximate by the point vortices. However, there is that he is getting is very, very sensitive on the discretization and the, and the choice of the ports. Now, there is a different approach by Kreichnan, and you can discretize also in the Fourier space. It means that you are going to take only finitely many frequencies, cut all the high frequencies, and then uh, um, try, to, try to form some, uh, some theory for this finite dimensional dynamical system by, by the Liouville theorem. And then pass to the limit. Now, this is a little bit better approach. And the invariant for the Kreichnam are going to be the energy, as we expect, and also the entropy, which is the integral of omega square. Remember, this is one of the, one of the Casimir invariants. However, these uh, and, and all other invariants are going to be gone. Yeah? Uh, everything else beyond uh, integral of omega square is going to be neglected. 
And the, another problem is that not only that the energy and entropy are, are uh, uh, preserved, but they are also preserved in the limit as time goes to infinity, even though we don't really expect the entropy to, to survive the passage to the limit. All right, so let's try to do, let's try to work with the full system. So what people did. So first of all, you can just say, okay, the full fluid is going to be mixed as much as possible. So maybe it's true that everything is going to zero weak star in the weak star converters, right? That's, that's, that's a possibility. But however, this is not compatible with the fact that energy is, is weak star continuous and we should get non-zero value at the, in, in the limit. So actually this scenario is probably true in three dimension. So that's why it doesn't make actually sense to, to work on this problem in 3D because uh, somehow there is a reasonable possibility that this ultraviolet catastrophe happens in the 3D, meaning that all the mass is going to be transferred to the higher and higher modes. And then in the limit, in the weak limit, everything is going to zero. All right. So now we can, we can build on the Krachnan approach and just say, okay, Fluid is not is it's not going to um, you know it's it, it's it's not going to mix everything because we need to conserve the energy but we are going to just minimize the entropy given the energy so we are trying to make the entropy we, we are kind of making an answer saying uh, the fluid is going to try to maximize the entropy now this is a well defined variational problem and that's the main advantage of the of the whole approach because it's taking these horrible Hamiltonian system on infinite dimensional leaves to pretty much variational problems. And which are, you will see that they are not that simple, but nevertheless, there are some techniques that, that we can approach. So we try to minimize this functional, then actually up to the Lagrange multipliers, the solutions are just the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And with the constraint that the, that the energy of the omega phi psi is the stream function should be should have the constraint of e. All right. The problem is that other invariants might not be preserved. The huge advantage of this one actually is this one. So if you are looking at the most stable eigenfunctions, those are the first ones with the zero mean. Then for the torus, which is a non-square torus, the first eigenfunction is something like a sine of x one. Right. So that really means that it depends only on one variable and it's independent of the other variable. However, for the square torus, then the first eigenfunction is sine of x1 plus sine of x2 with some coefficients, maybe. And if we plot these, if we plot this function, actually you're going to see something very similar to these dipoles. So there is a hope that maybe there is some uh, reasonable connection between these minimizations and the numerics, and maybe even the truth for the Euler's equation. All right, so people improved on these models. Uh, the point is that uh, we had the measure which is a priori preserved by the flow. So we don't have to go to the discretization and use the Lidl theorem for the, for, the, for the Lebesgue measure. But actually, since, uh, since Euler's equation is the transport equation, uh, the level sets of omega are preserved by the flow. So if we are looking at this measure, which is going to be uh, just a measure of i such that omega naught of x is in i, uh, then this is, a, in, this is a usual invariant measure. So this could be a good choice for our canonical measure kappa. The problem is that it was already questioned by the Turkington. Um, the problem point is that somehow, if you are starting with initial condition, which is plus one and minus one, that's the easiest one. Then if you, are do, the, if you do the mixing, then everything is somehow mixed uh, with these plus or minus ones. That's still not a problem, but the problem is if you want to do the counting for how, how to define the entropy, then you need to discretize. And you discretize, say, you choose n square of small squares in your torus, and then you start putting plus or minus ones, and then, then you do some, some combinatorics and you get the result. 
The problem is that if we do plus one at one square and the minus one on the uh, uh, on the on the neighboring square, then uh, you have a very sharp transition. On certain scale, it's not clear why this is the right one. Why why there are some like anomalous uh, uh, transition which shouldn't actually be there. So what Turkington said. Okay, maybe this is not the most natural way to do, do, do the things. What he said is maybe even on the smaller scales, on the smaller uh, and one of the n squares, uh, I already have a smaller, yet smaller structures that it's pre mixing uh, the, these plus or minus ones and, and giving me this mesoscopic value, say one half. So, and at and that moment, you, you can choose in your mesoscale not only the values plus or minus one, but anything between plus or minus one. And how do you choose it? And how, how, how you put the probability to somehow close the system, he decided that he's going to put kappa as a normalized Lebesgue measure on these, for these young measures, meaning for, the, for each interval, for, for each point, there is a small interval where, where it's, which is carrying my distribution, and he's saying, let's put the Lebesgue measure of our, our basic measure for these intervals. All right, so there are some problems even with the Turkington's approach because it's going to assign to infinite entropy to any finite time evolution, which is not nice, as you, as you may agree. Um, so it's not completely clear if one should choose this measure of Miller and Robert, or why don't you choose Turkington or something in between or something completely different? Okay, so maybe there is a different measure. All right, so in our approach, we decided, okay, we are not going into this, into this fight, what, what might be the best measure, what best mixing measure, but we are going to assume arbitrary Borel measure. Okay, so at that moment, uh, we are going to take arbitrary kappa, any, anything that somehow reasonable say Borel measure and we are going to minimize the entropy and these are going to presumably be the most probable states that we are going to see for the Euler's equation however we have also constraints because we are minimizing with respect to the, the, to the given dynamics so first of all we have uncountably many Casimirs so uh, okay so first uncountably many constraints are coming for, just from the fact that we are working probability density functions, meaning that rho is not negative. It turns out that this is a pretty difficult constraint. Then it should be the probability distribution and it should give us an expectation out of vorticity omega. Then we have uncountably many Casimir invariants that can be written as a, as a set of uncountably many inequalities. And then, but all of these constraints, these constraints are convex. This, these constraints, Casimir constraints are convex. Plus, we have an energy which is a special one. That's that's the one that's coming with equality, and this one is a non-convex, non-convex uh, constraint. Okay, so if you think about this one, uh, this is somehow a variational problem, but with uncountably many constraints. Some of them are convex. Some of them are not. That's, that's somehow the, the, the beast that we would like to tackle. All right, so what's the result, what we were able to prove? And it's telling you that uh, if t this, this, this square is not a square togus, so meaning that we have, we have just a unique principal eigenvalue, then if the energy is sufficiently small, then the minimizers depend only on one variable. And again, we don't expect any qualitative result, sorry, any quantitative results because we don't know what the measure is. But this result is actually true independently on, the, on this underlying mixing measure kappa. So uh, this is somehow telling you that if you are willing to take this ergodicity, ergodic hypothesis approach, then it's actually going to show you that the most probable state should be the bar states as we see in the numerics or as we see on Jupiter. So presumably there might be some, some bit of truth in, the, in this approach. Nevertheless, it's an interesting variational problem. So, so we can study it mathematically. 
All right, so the question is what's happening with the square turtles? Well, it's not even clear what's a good question in that, that point, because it's not easy to, uh, to characterize what the dipole is. So we know that if we try to find the functions that are, say, say odd, then uh, we know that such functions do not exist. So it's, it's not clear what, what, what would be a good question. Uh, we can quantify pretty well what, how small the, the uh, energy needs to be in order to guarantee the, the, uh, the symmetry, the one-dimensionality. And it depends on the size of the ratio between the size of the torus in particular. So it somehow depends on this spectral gap. Uh, if E is not small, if energy is not small, then there are good indications that there is a symmetry breaking. So there is a, we have some hand waving arguments why the symmetry is not going to preserve for the large energies. All right. So, all right. So what's going to be the idea of the proof? So let me spend the last 10 minutes somehow to give you some techniques, how, how, how we approach this problem. So again, we'd like to minimize uh, this problem. Uh, where mu is a probability measure, absolutely continues with respect to kappa. And we are given these Casimir constraints. Um, then we have the, the thing that this Young's measure has the right expectation and the energy is going to be exactly the right energy as equality. So first of all, it was proved already by Boucher, Ellis and Turkington for general measures that uh, if you choose the space as a space of probability measures with weak star topology or weak topology or the washer star distance, then this functional is going to be bounded from below and lower semi-continuous and the constraints are continuous. So that really means that from abstract variational problems, you can get that there exists, there, there exists a minimum, there exists a minimizer. If you want to, okay, so we have minima, but now we'd like to write the Euler-Lagrange equation. And that's actually assumed in these applied math literature that you can write these Euler-Lagrange equations, but actually it's pretty difficult because you can write the Euler-Lagrange equations only when, when your probability distribution is never zero. And uh, the point is that this is pretty difficult to prove. Well, it's difficult, it's very technical. So uh, we, we did this rigorous derivation based of the Euler uh, Lagrange equation that, that it, it requires a lot of measure theory in order to do that. Okay, so that's, that's very technical proof. It's not, I guess, too exciting to see. All right, so at that moment, you can write down the Euler Lagrange equation and it's not anything like too nice. So like, Euler Lagrange equation is this one, is rho xy is equal to somehow the Gibbs measure, it means that it's exponential of minus lambda times y times psi of x, and there shouldn't be this parenthesis, plus a y plus b x. And this lambda is kind of a Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the energy. A is a Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the Casimir invariant. And B is the normalization, so, so that we are assuming that we are working with, uh, with probability measures. All right, and uh, if we are going to take the average, okay, so we take the expectation, uh, and we'll see that this, you know, we, we, we saw that this actually not sufficient to get all the information, then we can formulate, uh, we can formulate the equation for the, for the stream function, and that really means that's telling us that the stream function should satisfy this equation. It's Laplace of psi of E is equal to minus Z prime, which is a partition function, which is the logarithm of this, this expression. Now notice in particular that there is this uh, Lagrange multiplier A of Y, and it needs to be determined from the constraints. So it's not only this equation, it's coming also with it's like elliptic equation, so it shouldn't be too difficult, but it's coming with infinitely, even uncountably many constraints. And these uncountably constraints are going to enter the equation through this A of Y as a Lagrange multiplier. And they're of course uh, changing the whole, whole equation. So you see it's like interconnected. The whole thing is very, very interconnected. The Z, Z prime is very complicated non-local operator on the Psi E. 
All right, so it's very non-local equation due to the constraints. Now, okay, let's let's get a feeling. So first of all, this z prime by simply by uh, basic inequalities, uh, Young's inequalities from the statistical mechanics, we know that z is a convex function. So that really means that the second derivative of z is going to be uh, is going to be positive, and that's actually giving us equilibria that are going to be stable as with respect to the R node. So that's a, that's a reasonably good sanity check that we are not getting unstable, unstable equilibria if there are any in this, in this situation. All right, so this is a very non-local e equation. And say, if we are looking at the simple settings, so say there are no Casimir constraints, so we are working in the uh, with a small value such that, there, so, such that there are no Casimir constraints, then this leads to two types of equations. First one is the model introduced by Miller and Robert, which is this uh, nonlinear elliptic equation, Laplace of psi is hyperbolic tangent of minus lambda times psi plus mu, where lambda and mu are Lagrange multipliers. Or if you are working with the Turkington setting, is leading to this nonlinear elliptic equation where this is f prime and f prime is logarithm of hyperbolic sine x divided by x, which is known Langevin function. Plus, we need to determine this lambda and mu even in this setting from energy and zero mean constraints. So already this, this, this is not completely trivial. All right, so what do we do about the whole problem? So let me, let me just give you some, some, uh, uh, some insights. The biggest problem to control anything is, um, is, to, is to know where to start. That's, that's somehow the most difficult step. So first of all, we can estimate that the constraint on the Lagrange multiplier that corresponds to the energy, it's always positive. So this is simply you just differentiate Euler Lagrange equation, test it, integrate, and then, then, you, then you get positivity. And this is already has meaning because this is telling you that these Gibbs energy states have negative temperature. So all the temperature, all the all the states that are presumably limit states of the Euler's equation should have these negative temperature in terms of uh, in terms of Gibbs. Now the biggest problem is now I'd like to control. We would like to control somehow the some norm of vorticity, uh, some norm of string function, anything. Think. The problem with that one that everything depends on the Lagrange multipliers, right? They are they're unknown. They're coming from constraints. So you would say, okay, but we would like to estimate somehow the Lagrange multipliers. The problem is that the Lagrange multipliers are very connected to the solutions. So it's very, very tricky to, to know where to start. And actually, the, the best starting point is to estimate the L2 norm of the vorticity. And we can prove that it's less than constant times the energy. So this, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the vorticity depending on the energy, and it's going to zero linearly, at least linearly, with respect to the energy. Now, the trick for this one is that somehow the entropy should control the L2 norm of the vorticity. Well, well that's not really true, because the entropy is bounded from below. That's, that's easy to prove, that's bounded from below by a fixed constant, and this should be should go to zero as uh, e, goes to the, e goes to zero. However, when you somehow normalize the entropy, if you subtract the minimizer of the, of the state without the energy, then you can, by some, some means, estimate that this omega e uh, L2 norm square is bounded by this. This is just a Holder's inequality, nothing else, and here, we are using that y is a, is a bounded function because it's in the torus, so bounded by constant, and the integral of the probability distribution is just one. So this is a constant that depends roughly on, uh, just depends on the size of the torus, and then we are left with that one. On the other hand, we can show that this quantity is bounded from above by the entropy, and that requires only some mean value theorem. So that's, that's, that's not, a, not, a, not a big deal, and uh, we can proceed and prove that this is our entropy minus the entropy of the of the minimal states when we have no constraints is actually by some mean value theorems bounded by the energy. 
And the main advantage of this one is that we get somehow the, the starting point. All right, so at that moment, we can, uh, uh, we can calculate, we can control not only the L2 norm of the vorticity, but we can also calculate the L2 norm of the stream function. And by some regularity uh, assumptions, uh, by the regularity theory, we can control also L infinity and even C1 path of the vorticity. And, uh, and proceed from there. So I don't have that much more time. So uh, you need to do much more estimates uh, to control all the, all the Lagrange multipliers. In particular, the Lagrange multiplier connected with the energy is tricky because uh, it's, there is no good bound for that one because any, any, uh, any eigenvalue of the Laplace is the Lagrange multiplier. So we need to use the second variation to prove that it's really the minimizer to somehow control the control the energy. And let me just do I have like one minute? Maybe. All right, so let me just show you uh, how we prove that the whole thing is one dimensional. So we know that uh, our stream function satisfies the, this big non local equation. And but still, we are going to assume that assume that uh, it's not a one dimensional. It means that the derivative with respect to x one is non zero. Okay, so this is not the direction of the principal eigenvalue. Now we normalize and we differentiate the function, the, the equation. So if we differentiate, we get the Laplace of eta e is equal to just you know chain rule minus lambda e second derivative times eta e. And now we are going to split this eta e in the direction of, of the principal eigenvalue, or uh, eigenfunction, and the rest. Okay, so psi e is in the direction of the principal eigenfunction, and then, then the r of e is perpendicular to this space. All right, with all the machinery that they, that they partly skipped, we can show that this reminder is going to zero as energy goes to zero. So that's what you would expect from some bifurcation theory. But we are not claiming any asymptotic result. We are really claiming that it's going to be one dimensional for any small value, not asymptotically. All right, so if that's the case, then uh, this is converging. And also the principle, like the L2 norm of this phi of E in the principal direction is converging to one. But now there's like an easy, like, like not easy, but, but nice calculation. Uh, it's just telling you this. If I, if I calculate um, the derivative of this psi of e, that's, that's a non-zero function, then this guy is actually perpendicular to phi of e, all right? Because that's, that's uh, by if I integrate by parts, phi depends on x2. So if I throw x1 on the phi, then I just get zero. That's one way. But then on the other hand, I can calculate this one. I can just plug it in. And up to the normalization constant, this is just this eta e, that was the derivative. And the eta e, I can split into two parts, which is going to be phi of e and the remainder. Well, the point is that this guy converges to one and this guy converges to zero. So for small energy, the whole expression here is going to be positive, but that's a contradiction. So, that's, that's, that, that's somehow, somehow the way how to prove this one dimensionality and, and that's, that, that's, that, that, will, that will wrap up the proof. So there are many open problems in this direction. Uh, for example, if you try to do the whole procedure on the disk or the annulus, then you have additional constraint. And the question is if you are going to get the radial, radial solutions in the limit or not. Um, all right. What's happening for the large large energy? That's that's not clear whatsoever. Uh, there is a possibility of symmetry breaking, but what are the minimizers? That's not clear. Uh, then uh, there, this machinery should work for other infinite dimensional systems, Hamiltonian systems like cubic NLS, KDV, uh, the Sego equation, Bona equation, many other equations. That should, that should presumably, if there is a good good uh, background or good numerics that would show something about entropy minimization, it should work in this, in this setting. And the biggest open problem, which is not clear whatsoever, is 
how these entropy maximizers affect the, the long-term dynamics. Is it true that the long-term dynamics is really governed by the entropy maximizers or not? All right, thank you. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, any questions for Euro? Does it make sense to look at this on other domains besides just radially symmetric, but just general planar domains? It does, but okay. So, so the whole theory of uh, Miller, Robert, Turkington, and, and the others should survive this transition. Uh, the point is that we are looking for something slightly different. We are looking at the, at the somehow uh, qualitative properties of solutions independently of this mixing measure, which is not completely clear. So this mixing measure, if it's given, then, then you, can, you, can, you can start deriving whatever you like, right? However, if it's not given, then it's not clear what's going to be the question because you just formulate your problem with kind of unknown measure. That's, 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 that's roughly the point. But, but yes, uh, the, the theory of like these ergodic hypotheses and all the, all the theory should, should, should work on, on, on any domain. It should even work in higher dimensions, but somehow we expect that in higher dimensions, everything is going to be roughly trivial in the limit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but yeah, like, like all these all these equations. The, the the question is the other equations should work as well, like SQG or NLS or or, or and other Hamiltonian systems. Depending on the number of constraints, it it, it will produce different problems. Any other questions? So you require this uh, energy e, uh, to be very small. So is there any way to estimate the threshold for e? How small do you, do you require? Uh, well, well, there is a, we have a reasonably good estimate, right? It, uh, the, the biggest thing it depends on is on the spectral gap, on the difference between the first and the second eigenvalue. And it depends linearly on that one. And then there is a big prefactor which depends on uh, on other things like the L infinity bound on the initial condition and, and, and stuff like that. But there is a okay, it's definitely not optimal, but there is a there is a computable computable energy for which it works. Okay. The point is that you can kind of try to do the same thing for the with some bifurcation analysis to do this. We tried and it doesn't seem to work. That's that's just way too many constraints to, to work with. So other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so uh, if no questions, let's thank uh, you again for his nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's stop sharing the screen. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the uh, talk. So is this like a public public seminar to to attend, or you need yes, to be affiliated with some? No, Some it's a public. It's public. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. So, and I can use the same link if 